In the summer of 2012, a man by the name of Saeed, a pastor by the name of Saeed, ended up having traveled back from the United States, where he was now a citizen, to the country of Iran, and working among orphans there in Iran in a ministry that he and his wife had begun, he ended up being arrested by the Iranian authorities, the summer of 2012. And he is still, this morning, in prison in Iran, a U.S. citizen imprisoned in that country, his homeland, but not his citizenship any longer, because of his faith and his stand for Jesus Christ. Persecution. It's not a subject that we like to think about, suffering for the cause of Christ. If you were Pastor Saeed, how would you respond? Or his wife, who is here in the United States and appealing to the U.S. government and others to intervene, but how would you respond in that time of persecution? The early church faced persecution. We saw it back in Acts chapter 4 as uh, Peter and John were arrested and jailed and then brought before the Sanhedrin, but that didn't deter them. We saw in chapter 5, the beginning of it, Satan attacking from within the church through Ananias and Sapphira, but that still didn't stop the church. And so as chapter 5 continues to unfold in the book of Acts, we see ongoing new persecution brought upon the church by the Jewish leaders. And when they had called the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go. And notice their response. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus, the Messiah is Jesus. They continued on in what God had called them to do, but they not only continued on, they continued on with what attitude? What's the word there? Rejoicing. They continued on with joy. And as I read those verses this week, they were convicting. Because I had to ask myself, if I had been beaten for my faith in Christ, not only would I continue to minister by God's grace, I would hope I would, but would I do it with joy? How in the world did they do it with joy? We here in the United States, we in the West, don't know a great deal about persecution. It's subtle. It may be a friend who doesn't talk to you anymore at school or who ridicules you or a co-worker who makes fun of your faith or other kinds of things. But it may be coming in more severe forms. We, we have now a national government in Washington that is the most hostile to Christianity that at least in my lifetime, I think probably in the history of our country. When you have a a justice department now that is saying that homosexual marriage is federally legal in every state of the union, no matter what the state governments say, that's hostility to biblical truth. When you have a, a president who is trying to force Hobby Lobby and other Christian-based companies to to violate their own convictions and provide abortion-causing drugs to their employees under penalty of law, that's hostility to the faith, to biblical truth. When you have the governor of New York telling pro-lifers and others who would hold values such as ours, you really don't belong in my state. Why don't you just leave? That's hostility to biblical truth. 
when you have at various military bases across the country instructors teaching that, that it is not just Al-Qaeda that we need to watch out for. We need to watch out for these fundamental Christians. That's hostility to the faith. And I think unless God sends a revival to our nation, what we have not known in the form of overt persecution may be coming. And if it comes, will we continue on with joy as the early church did? When the church is on the move, it will do that. And that's the theme that we've been looking at together as we've studied Acts. The church, Jesus' church, on the move. But how did they continue with joy? I'd suggest to you that in the passage beginning in Acts chapter 5 and verse 12, we really see two ways of thinking, two perspectives that God gave to them. This isn't natural, this is supernatural. But two perspectives that enabled them and will enable you and me to continue on in times of persecution. And if you want to do a secondary application, even in times of suffering as well. So let's think about what encouraged them and let it encourage us. The first is that we need to accept that persecution will come. We need to expect suffering for the cause of Christ. Paul said, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus said to his followers, if they hated me, and they did, then they will hate you. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, when you suffer, don't think that it's strange, but rejoice because they persecuted the prophets in the same way. And I think that that way of thinking permeated this early church so that when it came, it didn't catch them off guard. Because you see, they understood something that we looked at a few weeks ago, that movement causes friction. Because they were on the move, because they were serving, because they were having having an impact, friction was going to come. Persecution was going to follow. This early church was doing many different kinds of miracles. Before we look at those verses, we need to understand That though God can act any way He chooses, all of us would affirm that, He can do a miracle anytime He pleases. As you look at it biblically, there are significant periods of time when God seems to pour out miracles and other times where there aren't a lot of them. When the nation of Israel began, God, through Moses, demonstrated His power in miracle after miracle, the plagues and other things that happened. And then they kind of disappeared for a while. When Elijah and Elisha came on the scene and called the people back to God, God poured out a period of miracles through those two men. And then you don't see much through the rest of Israel's history. When Jesus arrived on the scene, God ministered through him, authenticating who he was as Son of God and Messiah, and all kinds of miracles took place. And as the church comes on the scene beginning on the day of Pentecost. In those early days, we see the apostles in particular doing many different kinds of miracles. But as we will notice through the book of Acts, those miracles begin to diminish over time. And by the time you reach the epistles and read the epistles, there's not a lot talked about miracle-wise. And in church history, the miracles seemed to cease as God used them in this early period to authenticate His people. And so we read, beginning in verse 12, Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. We don't have those anymore, so uh, that was a particular power and authority they had. And they were all together in Solomon's portico in the temple. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. That goes back to what just happened. Ananias and Sapphira and their hypocrisy died, and and so unbelievers kind of took a step back and said, we better not join this unless we're serious. 
And then verse 14 tells us, and more than ever, other people did join. Who? Believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats. As Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. What we see is power there, God's power. We see people in awe. We see a church that is growing. We see a message that's spreading out into the countryside, so people outside the city are hearing it as well. And there's broad attraction and interest. There's even this kind of superstitious belief that if Peter's shadow just crosses somebody who's sick, they'll be healed. Notice Luke doesn't say that that actually happened. He just says people believed it would happen. We don't know if it happened or not. But certainly others who were brought to the apostles are healed. As God in power demonstrates that this group of people, this church, is from Him. It is His people. And that attraction of people, that display of power, attracts the attention and the opposition of the Jewish leaders. And so we read in verses 17 and 18, But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. Because you see, movement causes friction. This was a church on the move. They were demonstrating their message through the miracles that God was providing and people were coming to faith in Christ and the religious leaders didn't like it. In fact, they were, you saw it in the verse, they were jealous of what was happening and of the influence and they try to stop it. Movement causes friction and bold witness may bring hatred I want us to jump ahead in the story. As this story unfolds, there are really three separate little vignettes of persecution. The first is that the the apostles are arrested and they're put in prison. And then they're brought before the council. That's the second one. Look at verse 27 with me. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charged you, that's chapter 4, not to teach in this name. Notice, he won't even say Jesus' name. We charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. In other words, we think you're doing this so that people will rise up and take vengeance on us. And notice Peter's response. It's really the same one he gave back in chapter 4. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Peter says, You may think you have authority over us. And in a sense, you do. But not in this realm. Peter understood what the theologians would later call sphere sovereignty. That is, that the government has a place of authority in our lives. It does. And the Sanhedrin had every right to call them in and to examine them because they were charged with overseeing the religious structure in Israel. They had every right to bring these men before them and ask them questions. But their authority over them ended when they said, stop preaching in the name of Jesus because God's authority trumps Sanhedrin's authority. And you and I, as citizens of this country, have the responsibility to obey the laws of this country. And as a church, we have a responsibility to file the appropriate paperwork for taxes. And I'm so glad that Sharon's on top of that kind of thing and I don't have to worry about it. And we have the responsibility to let the firemen in to inspect and to do those kinds of inspections and to to apply and to fill out paperwork for the state in various areas. But if the state of Michigan or the federal government were to come in and say, all right, this is now law of the land. You must 
marry two men and two women as actual couples and you have to sanction their marriage, then we would say, no, we don't. Because you have authority, but God's authority trumps yours. And that's what the apostles are doing. They're saying, yes, you have authority over us, but we must obey God, not men, when they come into conflict. And so Peter is going to, from there, go on and preach the gospel. And he boldly proclaims to them the truth of who Christ is again. He did this back in chapter 4. Now he does it again in chapter 5. And he says to them, the God of our fathers raised Jesus. Notice he starts with the resurrection instead of the crucifixion. Kind of an interesting point. He says, God raised Jesus. By the way, you killed him. By hanging him on a tree. That's why God had to raise him. And God has exalted him to his right hand, to the position of power as leader, as prince, as savior. And God now offers to Israel repentance and forgiveness through him. And we're witnesses to the truth of that, Peter says. And so is the Holy Spirit. You wanted to know what happened when the Spirit was poured out? He's a witness too. Jesus poured him out as the leader, as the Savior, and Peter boldly proclaims Christ to the Jewish Sanhedrin. And the leaders respond with hostility to that bold witness, with hatred. Look at verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged. They're in a furor, and they wanted to kill them. That's where I get the idea of hatred. You don't usually want to kill people you don't hate. They want to kill them. They want to get rid of them. And let's just put that on pause for a minute and jump to the third picture, the third little vignette of persecution. It's found in verses 40 and 41 where we see that firm faith, which Peter and the other apostles demonstrate, may bring punishment. And in this case, it does bring punishment. Look at verse 40 with me. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them. That would be the 39 stripes typically given probably by the Jewish Sanhedrin. They beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy, that God had entrusted them with suffering, with persecution counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And in spite of persecution, they continue to preach the gospel with joy. How do they do that? I think it comes back to what they believed. It comes back to how they thought. And they said, you know what? Jesus told us persecution would come. We're just going to accept the fact that it's going to come. And when it comes, we're going to continue on with joy. Now from my perspective, probably from your perspective because you're a a good American, it doesn't seem fair. Let's just admit it. That healing brings jail time. That's not right. It doesn't seem fair that bold witness causes people to hate. It doesn't seem fair that being firm in your faith ends up with punishment. And yet that is exactly what millions of our brothers and sisters in Christ in this world face. Though we do not face it yet, they do. This is the story of a pastor in China. He says, I can't recall how many times I've been imprisoned because it was too many The longest sentence I served was three years, but I also served many short detentions. He goes on, I endured much hardship when I was in prison. Right at the beginning, my ears were beaten with an electric baton, and fluid kept flowing from my ears for six months. My hearing has been greatly hindered ever since then. Another time, my leg was beaten, and its swelling became large. My fellow prisoners had me clean the toilet, and to do the job, I had to have the injured leg kneel on an ice cold concrete ground and then he says this I would like to tell those who would hear my testimony 
drink the cup that Jesus drinks. For a student is not above his teacher. Our light troubles are temporary. Beatings are temporary. Pain is also temporary. But eternity and joy are everlasting. That's the perspective that you and I need to have when persecution, when suffering comes into our lives as well. doesn't mean that we seek persecution. doesn't mean that we should say, wow, we here in the West, we're so slighted because we haven't really been able to experience that. I think I'll go out and stir up some persecution. No. In the sovereignty of God, He has spared us for this time. But I want us to understand the book of Acts is written to help us understand how to be prepared when it comes in a localized fashion for you or when it comes across the board for all of us. We need to accept that it will come, that Jesus told us not to be surprised when it comes. And I don't like to think about that any more than you do. But we do need to be ready and to have that mindset, that way of thinking. There is a second way of thinking that they demonstrate that is interwoven with these three little vignettes of suffering that make up the larger story. And as you put those together, we see that one of the ways that we need to think is also that we need to believe that God is at work, even in the persecution. That you and I, when that comes, or when any kind of suffering comes, that you and I believe it is because God is still there and He is still at work, not that He's abandoned us. In times of suffering, in times of persecution, that's a danger. That we feel like, where is God in this? He must have just abandoned us. That's why we're suffering. But the story shows us that's not the case at all. In fact, as we look at the story unfolding, we we see that sometimes God directly intervenes in rescue. Sometimes He doesn't let the persecution play out as it might have otherwise. And in a sense, you could say that much of our history as a, a nation has been God sovereignly intervening in such a way that we haven't known what other peoples have known. Look at verse 18 and notice how God sovereignly intervenes. But they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. I love that description of the gospel. Tell them about life, real life, eternal life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak. They had to wait till the temple opened. And they began to teach. We're not told how it comes about exactly. We're just told that an angel goes and he takes them out of the prison cell. It's interesting that in a little bit when the high priest questions them, we saw that, he never asks, how did you guys get out? I'd ask that question. Wouldn't you have asked that question? I don't think he wants to know. (laughs) I think he's afraid of the answer. Because the Sadducees didn't believe in angels. And it's kind of ironic that God then sends an angel to say, okay, you don't believe in angels? Let me use one to get the apostles out of prison. But the point is, God comes in and he miraculously allows them to escape from that prison. And they go on and they preach. And then the story continues on in verse 21. Look at the rest of it. It's kind of humor here that Luke interjects. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council and all the senate of the people of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought because he doesn't know what we know. They're not there. Read on. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison. So they returned and reported We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. I mean, can't you imagine the ripple that goes through the room of the Sanhedrin when they hear that? And it it even says, when the temple, when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed, I would think. 
And they wondered, what's this going to come to? What's going to happen? What has happened? But before they begin to investigate, somebody shows up on the scene and says, hey, by the way, those guys you locked up, you want to know where they are? Verse 25, look, the men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and preaching or teaching the people. Isn't that interesting? They're continuing on with joy, and God has released them. He has allowed them to escape from prison, from that persecution. And so the authorities rearrest them. Verse 26, the captain of the guard goes and he brings them back to the Sanhedrin. But notice he does that very gently, very carefully because they're afraid of the crowd. They're afraid that they may be stoned by the people who are listening because the people are enjoying what is being taught and the power that is coming through these men. Sometimes God directly intervenes in rescue. Sometimes He intervenes in a different way. Sometimes He intervenes through unexpected means to lessen the suffering that might be there otherwise. We've already seen how Peter stands up and says, we've got to obey God, not men. We've seen how Peter then preaches the gospel to this Sanhedrin, and when he does, we've seen their hatred of him and that they want to kill the apostles. Notice how God intervenes, beginning in verse 33. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people. Gamaliel, we know from secular history, he was one of the great teachers of Israel. He was a Pharisee. He was not a Sadducee. He believed in God and believed in miracles. In fact, he is the teacher of another name you will know better, Saul of Tarsus. The apostle Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was Gamaliel's student. And Gamaliel stands up, and he gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. He says, guys, let's go into executive session here. Put the prisoners out. We need to talk about what has happened. And then he says, men of Israel, take care what you were about to do to these men. For before these days, Thutius rose up, and he talks about what Thutius did. We don't know this Thutius from secular history. There is one that happens after this, and some scholars have said, well, Luke obviously has got his history all mixed up. No, it's probably that Thutius is a name that's common, and there was a Thutius earlier in Israel's history that led 400 men out in, into the desert. He tried to stir up a rebellion. When he's killed, the movement breaks apart. Gamaliel drags up another one, a man named Judas the Galilean, him we do know from secular history. In the days of Herod, he led a group of men in a revolt against the taxation, and the people followed him. But when he died, his followers scattered. And so Gamaliel says in verse 38, So in this present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice. Now, uh, the first reading, you think, well, that sounds pretty good. Gamaliel sounds like he maybe has his head on straight until you realize what he's doing. He, he's got his feet firmly planted in both camps. <laughs> He's saying, you know, it may be that they're of men, and in that case it'll end, or it may be they're of God, in that case you can't stop it. But he never says, maybe we ought to look and investigate and see if it's of God. In fact, we can assume that he may well have been one of the ones who voted to crucify Jesus and in essence said the movement wasn't of God. But he's shrewd enough to understand that they just better step back and keep their hands off right now because this is a popular movement among the people. And so the leaders listen to him, and they don't kill them. And God uses a man named Gamaliel to intervene, an unexpected source, to alleviate, to lessen the suffering and the persecution. But we've already seen what happens in verse 40. They're beaten 39 times. 
So sometimes God allows us to suffer. And see, that's really important to remember because we want to latch onto that first one. And we want to say, okay, God, get me out of here. Get me out of prison. Get me out of suffering. Send an angel, you know, whatever you got to do. Send in the Marines. I don't care what it is. Just get me out of here. God doesn't always do that. Sometimes he, he uses unexpected ways to lessen it. And sometimes he lets his people suffer. Go through the persecution. And that goes against so much of what we Western Christians experience and even what we believe. But God's people do suffer. And it is not always God's will that we be healthy and wealthy and safe. And they rejoiced that they were counted worthy, that God had trusted them enough to suffer. How do we continue on with joy when we suffer, when we're persecuted for righteousness' sake? We have to believe that God is at work. That's the only source of joy. Say, you know what? This isn't my doing. I didn't bring this on myself. I can't control it, but I trust that God's doing something that I don't even see here. God can move in the hearts of leaders. He can work in amazing ways. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into the fiery furnace, and Jesus comes and walks in the furnace with them, and they're not burned up at all. And yet, Christians through the centuries have been martyred, burned at the stake, alive, and God allowed that too because he's sovereign. And we have to trust that he's at work whatever is being accomplished. God doesn't always deliver us. We have to trust. In fact, in the book of Acts, in chapter 4, Peter and John weren't rescued from prison. They had to stand before the Sanhedrin. But in chapter 5, they're all rescued from prison. In chapter 12, James is locked up and he loses his head. He's beheaded. Peter's locked up and another angel comes and releases him. In chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in prison. There's an earthquake. The doors open. Their chains fall off. In chapter 28, Paul is still in prison as the book ends. God doesn't have to work in the way you and I think he ought to work. You and I need to be convinced that he's at work even when we don't see it even in the midst of that persecution. And by the way, that, that's true of lesser suffering as well. That we go through suffering with joy when we understand that whether I like what's happening or not, God is still on the throne, and he is still at work in this, and I can trust him in the midst of it. And so verse 42 says, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Continuing on with joy. That's the challenge that's before all of us. How do we do that in the midst of suffering, particularly in the midst of persecution? Well, we do it by accepting that persecution will come. We do it by believing that God is at work. It really is. In this passage, A plus B equals C. That's how we continue on. With that kind of thinking, with that kind of commitment, that suffering will come, but God is at work in it. One of the places where our brothers and sisters are suffering today is in the country of Egypt. As that country's chaos continues, Christians have been targeted. Here is one testimony of an Egyptian Christian sent to a magazine by email. He alludes to the story of Jesus walking on the water in it. And he says this, God has always been faithful to us. We live in Egypt today with hearts full of peace and joy, realizing that even as we are on that boat, in the middle of the dark night, in the middle of the high waves, Jesus will show up walking on the waves. That's believing that God is at work. And that's our challenge as followers of Jesus Christ. 
And this morning, if you don't know this Jesus we've been talking about, go back to the message that Peter preached Understand that he died on a cross for your sins. He rose again. He is seated at the right hand of God, and he is the only Savior. And you might not outright persecute people who believe that, but I want you to know if you don't believe that, if you don't place your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, then you are aligning yourself with the enemies of God, with those who do persecute. And you need to change sides. You need to get your life right with God through faith in Jesus Christ today. For the rest of us, we need to accept, we need to believe, and we need to continue on with joy. Let's pray, shall we? Father, none of us in this room know when persecution will rear its head It could happen this week to an individual through their employer or in their school or in their neighborhood or even in their family. We can see signs of it on the horizon in our country. And we pray that in your grace you might forestall that and send revival. But whatever you send, Father, help us to live out our faith as the church of Jesus Christ in the midst of whatever persecution, whatever suffering, whatever trials you may send our way. May we live it out confident in the reality that you are at work in our lives and you are conforming us into the image of your Son. It's in his name that we pray.